Welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Welcome to the Mad in America podcast. This is Justin Carter, the longtime editor of the research news section of Mad in America, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Today, we're honored to host Mark Freeman, Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Society in the Department of Psychology at the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. Freeman is a renowned author and a pioneering voice in the emerging field of the psychological humanities. His body of work, most recently the critically acclaimed Toward the Psychological Humanities, offers a profound reimagining of psychology, interweaving it with the arts and humanities to better understand the human condition. In this interview today, we'll explore Dr. Freeman's personal journey toward the psychological humanities, delve into his work in narrative psychology, and discuss his approach to the concepts of self and other. We'll also touch upon how his perspectives guided him as he navigated his mother's journey through dementia, a deeply personal narrative he outlines in one of his books. So Dr. Freeman, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Pleasure to be here, Justin. Thank you. Could you start by letting our listeners know a little bit about who you are and what inspired you in your journey toward this version of psychology and the psychological humanities, how this path shaped your career? In some ways, it's hard to know exactly where to begin. I mean, I could I could go back uh, as far as junior high and high school when I was a singer in a rock and roll band, but um, I'll, I'll probably leap ahead instead to... Uh, to being an undergraduate at Binghamton University, that was in um, that was in the 1970s. Uh, like a lot of people who pursue psychology, I was interested in I was interested in big ideas, deep issues, you know, plumbing the depths of the human condition. And that really wasn't what was happening uh, at that point. I mean, on some level, it's still not happening. But back then, uh, things were predominantly behavioral um, in orientation. I was kind of shocked by the whole thing. I mean, partly that was a function of my naivete. I had just imagined that psychology was something really rather different than what it was. And that's partly because I got my images of what psychological understanding was through places like literature and film and the arts and so on. As luck would have it, I stumbled upon two courses, and it really was luck. Uh, I, I took a course in phenomenological psychology in the philosophy department, uh, and I won't pretend to have known at the time what phenomenological psychology was, but I read the course description, and it sounded kind of cool, and it was way closer to what I thought psychology was and also might be, so I was really turned on to that. And I also did take a course in the psychology department called Visual Thinking, um, where the main text was um, a text called Visual Thinking by Rudolf Arnheim, who um, was one of the most prominent psychologists of art for many, many years. And that too really turned me on, and I wound up doing a, a term paper on Gestalt psychology and art. And and just found like I was beginning to uh, to find myself and to find my way into at least some version of the discipline. The question, of course, after that is what to do. Okay, so I had these funky new ideas about what psychology might be. Uh, I was eager to pursue them in some way, but of course, there aren't many places where you can do that. Um, I took off several years. Did some extensive traveling in the States and around Europe, and eventually uh, had the great good fortune of, of finding a place that really seemed to suit me, and that was the University of Chicago. Um, I enrolled in the Committee on Human Development, which was a mixture basically of the social sciences and, for me, philosophy. Um, it was a kind of do-it-yourself program. I would say most of the people who got their PhDs in the committee turned out to be uh, psychologists, but some became anthropologists, some became sociologists, um, and and so on. So it was a very heady place to be. And there were a couple of things that I just would call attention to, and it might seem like I'm going into too much detail about this, but 
it's actually relevant. Um, in the Committee on Human Development, the main focus was to study human lives in as comprehensive, multifaceted a way as possible. Um, so we were required to take courses in things like developmental psychology, that sort of thing. Um, but also courses in the sociology of the life course and cross-cultural human development uh, and other things. And, and at that point, there was a big focus, especially on the idea of life history um, and, and how to understand it, right? How do we understand the movement of a human life? What kind of methods are appropriate to it? Um, so that's going on in the Committee on Human Development. But I also went to Chicago because I was interested in learning more about the work of the philosopher Paul Ricoeur, um, that I saw that he was teaching a two-semester seminar in the phenomenology of time consciousness. Um, it was risky territory for me. I, I had some philosophy, but not a whole lot. And we had to read in the first semester... Plato and Plotinus and Aristotle and St. Augustine, and all of that was new to me. Second semester, Husserl, Heidegger, all that. And Ricoeur at that point was also really doing a deep dive into the idea of history and historiography and their relation to narrative. And in fact, he wound up teaching another course that I also had the great privilege of taking called Historicity, History, and Narrative. Um, and it was precisely about the kinds of issues that I was pursuing in human development, but on a much broader plane. And we were reading literature, we were reading history, we were reading historiography, we were reading psychoanalysis, and more. So there was a kind of amazing confluence between what was going on in my home department um, and and what was going on in in philosophy at the time, especially through the work of of Ricoeur, so that really just sent me to a really quite extraordinary place. And you know, the very first piece I ever did is when I was a grad student. It was a very audacious piece uh, called "History, Narrative, and Lifespan: Developmental Knowledge." which I published in the journal Human Development. It was back in 1984. Because I just had to figure out some way of integrating and synthesizing all the stuff that I was learning. Otherwise, I you know, would have exploded, <laughs> so to speak. The other thing was I did engage in some empirical research, broadly speaking. Um, I became involved in what was known then as the Artist Project, which was led by Mihai Csikszent Mihai, Mike Csikszent Mihai, the person who's best known for the idea of flow. And he had a research project that studied a group of aspiring painters and sculptors who'd been schooled at the Art Institute of Chicago in the mid 60s. And the goal was to figure out, to find out what they had and hadn't been doing some two decades later. Um, so I got to travel to all kinds of funky places, you know, ranging from the Hamptons to Soho um, and also outside of New York, uh, to have very extensive talks with some, some of these people. Um, and so that kind of threw me headlong into the art world and what was happening in the art world, what was happening in the world of culture more generally, what kinds of work, um, you know, sort of had currency and cachet, what kinds of work didn't, and so on. So all of that really was going swimmingly. I was getting a lot of stuff in print. I had these incredible mentors who were helping me along and so on. And then the question was, well, where do I go with that? Um, and, you know, quite honestly, there are some people who are casualties of the University of Chicago because they might have been terrific scholars, thoroughly interdisciplinary, innovative, creative, and more. Uh, 
but that's not what most departments are looking for, <laughs> um, especially psychology departments who are generally looking for people whose work is much more specialized, that fits into the journals that are generally considered to be the best, um, which often aren't. But again, in a real stroke of luck, I saw an ad. It was 1985 or 1986. The College of the Holy Cross wanted somebody to teach phenomenological psychology and just about anything else I wanted to do. So I was lucky to land there. And uh, this is now my 38th year. I've been there ever since. So to jump ahead a little bit, the first two books I did, one of them was tied to the artist project. It was called Finding the Muse, a socio-psychological inquiry into the conditions of artistic creativity. And the other um, was called Rewriting the Self, subtitled History, Memory, Narrative. Of the two, it's actually the latter book that was more of a precursor to what would eventually become known as the psychological humanities. Um, and it was and remains kind of an odd book uh, in some ways, especially in relation to what was going on at the time. Um, it's a book uh, in which each chapter focuses on a literary text. Uh, five of those texts are non-fictional, one fictional. The Non-fictional texts range from St. Augustine's Confessions uh, all the way to Philip Roth's, quote, autobiography um, called The Facts. Um, the one work of fiction that I uh, explored was Jean-Paul Sartre's Nausea. So I was interested in issues that are arguably, though maybe not in the eyes of some psychologists, Issues that are plausibly called psychology, memory, identity, history, narrative, all of that. Um, but I was moving into the humanities and moving into literature as a prime vehicle for doing that. You know, that was a focus for quite a while. And, and eventually I expanded that focus. Because I didn't only want to write about books, I also wanted to write about people. And eventually those people would include my father, one of my daughters, my mother, and on some level, um, myself. It's challenging work to do. You never want it to be too self-indulgent or confessional. Um, but... I did want to explore the lives of people I knew and cared about, and that led me to think more deeply still about what it means to be human. Let's say that's a perfect jumping off point to thinking about where this latest book takes its origin in 2015. Uh, in the beginning of the book, you name this conflict that you're feeling between the work that you've been prepared to do through the studies you've outlined for us and really thinking about what a psychology for people looks like uh, and noticing the ways that psychology writ large embodied in the American Psychological Association has somehow gotten away from being about people. You write that psychology was weird and at times positively wrongheaded and deplorable. And you start to outline some of the tensions that you're feeling at the time as a president uh, of one of the divisions of the American Psychological Association, the Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology Division, and uh, outline a different way forward for the field in that talk. Um, so I wonder if, can you bring us uh, there, bring our listeners there uh, to thinking about uh, how why you felt so deeply conflicted about your role at that time? It was a very, very difficult time for me to be president of the division. And the reason actually had to do with what was going on in the APA at large. And I don't know if you recall, but one of the main topics was what they referred to as 
enhanced interrogation techniques, um, otherwise known as torture. And, and that was one of my takeoff points. And, um, and it occupied a lot of my time and thought. So the word deplorable is a strong word, maybe too strong. I wouldn't want to use that word to characterize the whole of psychology, but I could certainly use it to characterize some of what was going on uh, at the time. But there were lots of other things, you know, that I had seen throughout my entire career um, that I also thought were wrongheaded in some ways, or if we want a somewhat more charitable version, just radically incomplete. I continued to see methodological narrowness. Uh, and while there were some efforts afoot to change that, for instance, in the Society for Qualitative Inquiry and Psychology, which as you know, I also became heavily involved in, um, psychology still had delimited its focus methodologically in a remarkably uh, parochial way, focusing especially on the kinds of phenomena that could readily be encapsulated, objectified, measured, and so forth. I have no particular interest in knocking that. There is certainly a realm of phenomena for which that kind of approach is appropriate and valuable. But there are so many other ways of exploring uh, the human realm, the human experience. And, um, and qualitative work was part of it, but I also was interested in pushing it even, even farther in some ways. I mean, there's some qualitative work that is fairly standard social science that's just not quantitative. Um, but as I say, I wanted to push things even farther, and not just for the sake of pushing things farther, <laughs> But for the sake of expanding the field of possibility in psychology as an arena of inquiry, um, what else did I see that led me to think some of it was and remains wrong-handed? A lot of the work in psychology is hermetic. People are speaking to one another about a relatively narrow band of phenomena, are often developing highly sophisticated and technical um, procedures, both in order to study those phenomena and to begin to explain them. That results in a lot of very, very technical, technical jargon um, that's often only accessible to those within that particular subfield and so on. Why? Well, you know, as I say in the book, if I really want to read something or experience something that plumbs the depth of the human experience and allows me not only to think about it in you know some intellectualized way, but maybe to feel it and to engage in some imaginative flight. I'm much more likely to read a good work of literature or go to the theater or go to a concert or what have you. Um, and and so by degrees. I also came to ask a very basic question. Why can't a portion of psychology have the kind of expressive, living, evocative power and passion that works outside the discipline sometimes have? As somebody who's deeply attentive to narrative, I'm wondering if you can say something about the type of language and narratives that are produced by mainstream psychology and how you see them working in the world around you with students that you work with, even in the broader political discourse. I'm thinking both of sort of our diagnostic nomenclature and how it's being widely used, but also the phenomena of a lot of young people increasingly using psychological concepts to understand themselves and other people. We're surrounded by narratives and they occur, of course, in sites ranging from the confines, so to speak, of our own lives to what's going on in the wider world, culturally, politically, um, and so forth. So 
You know, one of the things that I've always done, or I've done for a very long time as a teacher, is give students the time and the space to be able to explore their own lives in and through narrative. And not just for the sake of introspection and insight into the, you know, the hidden corridor, so to speak, of their own personality. But to begin also to understand some of the discourses and forces that have led them to lead the lives that they have in terms of the expectations that have been put upon them, in terms of the desires that they have, in terms of what it is that they see as being a meaningful and valid life. And so for many years now, I've had students engage in some considered narrative work. I've sometimes called them narrative self-analyses. I've sometimes called them mini memoirs. And they have to really work hard at those. They have to do multiple drafts. They have to get some feedback. And as I tell them, oftentimes these stories need to be both about you and not about you. You need to be able to tell a story that addresses some feature of psychological life that exists beyond you as a self. And that's actually a quite hard thing to do. I guess so. One of the parts I was uh, pushing for with this question is thinking about how the hermetic discipline of mainstream psychology, the hermetic seal is broken. And these concepts that are forged in increasingly specialized and experimental settings become part of the popular discourse or become part of the ways that uh, people are are making sense of themselves and other the relationships to other people. And I'm thinking a little bit uh, about, uh, as a narrative psychologist, how you see that in your work, the sort of increased psychologization uh, rather than the sort of poetic or humanities or literary approach to kind of understanding our lives. A psychologization, you know, as you as you yourself just said, it's it's part of the fabric of con- contemporary culture and has even become more visibly so in recent years, um, as people talk about, you know, the anxiety that derived from COVID and 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 all the rest. And meanwhile, students are taking courses in psychology departments where they are um, being exposed to the DSM and the jargon of psychology and diagnostic categories and on some level applying them to their own lives. You're, You're probably familiar with the looping effect. So, you know, that certainly happens. I mean, on some level, we become the selves that we're reading about and studying about and that are circulating uh, through through contemporary culture. Some of that's fine <laughs> in its way. So, you know, my goal would never be to say, nor would it be possible, disregard all of that, stand apart from all of those discourses and categories that are circulating, and see if you can move into the depths of your own truth. You know, that would be, quote, unhermeneutical. It would assume the possibility that we could extricate ourselves from all that surrounds us and somehow encounter and behold ourselves nakedly. And as you well know, that's not possible. What is possible is to provide some resources that can allow students to interrogate things, to become aware, more aware at least, of the way in which they are constituted and formed and perhaps on some level deformed as modern selves. And so there's a limit to what can be done in the span of a semester or a year. I have no illusions about you know, being some magical transformative force. But to be able to have students, and I work almost exclusively with undergraduates, to be able to have them acquire some critical consciousness in the way that we're talking about, some historical consciousness, 
in the sense of being more aware of the formative factors that have culminated, at least in their way of thinking about themselves. One has to be very cautious in doing these things. You know, if, if I'm going to write about my mother or my father or myself, and I'm going to try to do it with some measure of honesty and integrity and depth, it's not only going to be risky, but it's almost certainly bound to be painful in some way. And I know that you say this as somebody who has written both about the self in general and yourself and your, your mother, as you mentioned. So uh, let me pick up on the self first. One of the really intriguing aspects of your work among many is this idea of the being able to transcend the self or transcending the self. Could you discuss how these transcendent experiences as exemplified in music or other forms of art, as well as in mystical and religious experiences, contribute to your understanding of human psychology and the human condition, uh, and even the interplay between the human and the divine? I certainly developed the interest through some of the things I was reading, like the Confessions, like people like Martin Buber and Emmanuel Levinas, um, and so on. I. Also, by virtue of being at the whole College of the Holy Cross, was engaged with dialogue with really smart people who are interested in things like religious experience. Um, and being in dialogue with those people allowed me to see, in some ways, the poverty of some of my previous education, because a lot of those issues were kind of ruled out of bounds as being either too religious or just too freaky for psychology. So that's part of it. But also, there was experience as such. Um, and, and for me, probably the best inroad into um, my moving in this direction was my own experience of music um, as both a listener and a player. You know, I mentioned earlier, I'd been, been a singer in a band many, many years ago. Um, I had played guitar, although not particularly well for some 40 years, um, and decided to finally take lessons when I was around 60. Um, and also just had some extraordinarily moving experiences, singing in choirs and listening to classical music and jazz and blues and so on. And it led me relatively early on to ask you know, what is this? What is this? And initially, how can I begin to understand it? Um, and on some level, can I even begin to understand it? Um, and so, you know, I moved back and forth between my own experience um, and also encountering some texts that really helped me think differently um, about, about these phenomena. One text that that really allowed me to think differently was William James's book, um, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which is not only about religion, but it is about things like the experience of nature, the experience of art, the experience of music, um, and so on. And I don't know how well you know James' book, but it's an extraordinary compendium of experiences of people who... Uh, are describing a kind of ecstatic oneness with the world, and you know James discusses the 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 central characteristics of mystical experience. People have the conviction that they're discovering new dimensions of knowledge and reality and selfhood and so on, um, and they also describe themselves. Um, as encountering some sphere of reality and being that is outside the perimeter of the self. And so, you know, in classic Jamesian fashion, towards the end of the book, he basically asks, so what is all of this? Are these just really cool and interesting, deep and provocative experiences that finally can be understood in a purely psychological way, which is to say naturalistically. Well, maybe it's unconscious, subconscious cerebration, as he calls it, or 
maybe it's some kind of biochemical phenomenon. He's also interested in the issue of why it is that so many people who have these experiences also have significant elements of psychopathology, including religious quote virtuosos, mystics, great writers, painters, all the rest. So he wants to answer the question, can all of this be understood in the basic terms that psychology has formulated, naturalistic, or might it be the case that there's something else at work? He doesn't know exactly what that is. He doesn't know what to call it. He refers at one point to spiritual energies, and well, we don't need to go into too much detail. And he offers us an answer in the final pages. He says, look, I can't possibly answer this question in any definitive way. All I can tell you is that what experience has revealed to me in multiple ways throughout the course of my life and throughout what I've learned from other people's lives is that there may be more to the human being than a purely naturalistic, wholly secular, so to speak, account can give. Um, I find that to be a courageous and very provocative move. And I'm not especially religious, so I should kind of get that out of the way. And as I said to one um, psychologist of religion probably 20 years ago, I said, look, you need to understand this. Um, I'm a Jewish guy from New York. My wife is a Lutheran who's basically become a Buddhist. My kids are confused Unitarians. So I'm not trying to smuggle in religious dogma through the back door. What I am trying to do is practice fidelity, radical fidelity, to what experience seems to tell us. <laughs> And there are so many ways in which we can explain things away. We can explain things away biochemically, neurologically, any one of a number of ways. But at times, I think it's important to really listen to what experience seems to say. And of course, the other related challenge is it also becomes important to find a language, and not only language, to be able to speak to experiences that are not readily articulable, explainable, and so on. And that also means moving into a different register of language and maybe even moving beyond language altogether for some of what we do in psychology. And part of how I'm hearing this whole project of the psychological humanities and the answers that you've given so far is that it's not just a supplement to psychology in some way, but is in fact necessary for students, uh, for people learning psychology to be able to think about how uh, to put the constructs and the narratives that they're learning together, how to make sense of them, how to hold them lightly how to make sense of themselves through different lenses, and then also to be able to sit with, with others whose experiences seem unknowable or uncharacterizable or where our language fails us. And I think you, you demonstrate in your work um, how this way of thinking about psychology prepares you, although you're not a clinician, for witnessing this kind of ineffability, uh, particularly uh, for, for one example, in your book um, about navigating the challenges of your mother's dementia called, Do I Look at You With Love? Can you share how your background in narrative psychology and this approach to the psychological humanities kind of influenced your perception and your experience of this deeply personal journey with your mom? So there I am as a student of memory, identity, self, and so on. And at one point, it was clear that uh, my mother was was falling victim to some was initially diagnosed as you know mild cognitive impairment that was painful and disturbing of course to her and uh, to me and my brothers and, and our families 
But I won't deny that it also became fascinating. And so relatively early on, I, I, I began writing. And I wound up basically writing four or five pieces that paralleled the trajectory of her disease across the dozen or so years of her dementia. And I, I will say in, in many ways, I see it as a real psychological humanities endeavor. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that it was probably that book more than anything that allowed me to move more from promising the psychological humanities or talking about it in an abstract way, we need to be poetic, we need to do, and actually doing it. One decision I made relatively early on, and some people might find fault with this, um, I decided not to read very much about dementia at all. I wanted my own understanding to grow out of what it was that I was seeing, what it was that I was observing, what it was that I was understanding. So how to find the language to do that? I mean, it's another, it's another challenge. It's not unrelated to the one we talked about. How do you find language to talk about phenomena that are in some fundamental way ungraspable? But there was another thing I wanted to do in the book. And that is so much of what I had read was almost exclusively tragic and understandably so. It's a tragic disease. And in some cases of dementia, it seems as if there's no story to tell except a tragic one of deterioration and demise. But that's not the only thing that I saw in my mother's experience. Yes, of course, I saw a deterioration and demise and protest and rage and confusion and what I call dislocation and lots of other horrifying, painful things. And I also saw beauty and joy and connection of a sort that I wouldn't have seen had she remained healthy. And that's such a strange thing to say, but it's true. And it's partly because I spent lots of time with her. And it was time also spent in attentive being there for her. I'm not trying to portray myself as a caregiver hero. There were times when I left to do other things and there were times when she would piss me off or I'd find annoying or frustrating, whatever. So all that's part of the story. But I also, you know, to use the language of the philosopher Levinas, I was called out of myself by the face, by her, by what she demanded of me. And that was an extraordinary process. Um, in some ways, I would consider it a process of my own maturation, um, you know, being able to set aside one's own preoccupations and, and on some level interests because somebody is really drawing you outward. Let me mention one other dimension, and this really gets to the psychological humanities. Um, I've been involved in an enterprise, or at least I was involved in an enterprise for a number of years called Art Transcending Borders at Holy Cross. And the goal of the project was basically to infuse the arts more visibly into the life of the college. But we decided early on that we would have a special class that was devoted to that. And it was called Create Lab. The first year of Create Lab, eight faculty were in a theater space together for the entire semester with about 70 students. There was a composer, a novelist, a sculptor, two people from theater, um, somebody from economic sociology, and, and myself. And we had a theme. The theme for that year was time, memory, and identity. And the goal was how do we bring together all of our interests, knowledge, skills as thinkers, as artists, and so forth to shed light on this 
trio of ideas. So we had about 40 students that year. Uh, they read my book. Another person who was teaching in the class, his mother is a well-known poet, and she was writing about dementia, partly because this fellow's father was in the throes of it. There was a photographer um, who taught at a nearby college whose father also had fallen prey to dementia, and he had done extraordinary kind of photo documentary work. So you have a, a work of psychological literature, you have photography, we have music, we have poetry. And the goal is for students not just to have the most comprehensive intellectual understanding of this difficult phenomenon that they can possibly have, but to also be able to approach it from a myriad of perspectives all of which can serve to illuminate it and deepen their own, not only understanding of it, but kind of feel for it in some way. I'm hearing in this psychological humanities approach that it offers a way of getting out of one way of seeing the person, one way of seeing the other, to be able to sit with different ways of understanding. And it opened up possibilities for you to see other elements of your mother's dementia, other elements of her person that otherwise you might have not been open to. Certainly here at Madden America, we have been focused um, for a long time on critique of the side disciplines broadly and uh, psychology as well through critical psychology. Um, so I, I want to pick up on, on uh, your final principle in your book on the psychological humanities, which is tear down the walls in the name of love. Uh, and you argue that any critique of mainstream psychology should come from a place of love. And so my question, and maybe to end our set here with a love song, is uh, what's love got to do with it? You know, for a long time, the kind of rap that I would share with my students took the following form. I would often say to them, you know, my problem really isn't so much with what psychology does, it's what it doesn't do, right? So I have no interest in you know, knocking down this or knocking down that and, and so on. And for the most part, I still don't. Um, but, but I do think that there are aspects of the edifice, so to speak, that really need to be dismantled. There's no way to really move ahead constructively and productively without a moment of destruction, without a moment of negation without a moment of critique. But the last thing I would want as a psychologist, and this I do mean, is to simply remain at the level of critique and continue to bitch and moan about what psychology is, what psychology isn't, and so on. I hope that you'll recall that early on in the book, I actually say, if I had to be a psychologist again, or if I had to make the choice of being a psychologist again, there's a good chance that I would do it. Why? Because psychology at its best, and I know other people have entirely different images of what at its best means, but for me, psychology at its best, getting to know other people, getting to really interrogate and explore imaginatively the human experience is a good and wonderful and even potentially noble thing to do. And so I don't want my work, especially as I move into the, the closing years of my career, I don't want it to be animated primarily by hostility or for that matter, even critique. I want to do it with a sense of what the discipline might be, or at least a portion of it, what it could be, what I believe it should be. And that requires care. It requires patience. And on some level, it requires love. But I really don't mean love in a, in a kind of mushy way, as I said before. I make some mention of Iris Murdoch, 
towards the end of the book. And she has some remarkable things to say about love or about eros more generally. And it has a lot to do with being attentive enough to the world to see it, or at least come close to seeing it as it is. And, you know, there are all kinds of ways that we could criticize that point of view. We could say, well, we never get to see it as it is. It's always informed by our prejudices and all the rest. And she undoubtedly knows that. And yet, there are ways in which we can become terribly beclouded by our understanding of things. And one of the faults of academic psychology is that through its vast arsenal of methods and techniques and scales and measures, it has beclouded our own encounter with elements of human reality that precede all of that arsenal of instruments. The ability to see human reality and the reality beyond the human clearly, attentively, and with true care for what is other, she suggests, is another way of speaking about love. Thank you so much, Mark, for your time today and for speaking to us about this uh, exciting new uh, way forward for our field. Pleasure to be here, Justin. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. For more news, views, and updates, visit maddenamerica.com.